Hello, everyone, and welcome to Friends Life Care Financial Symposium and our current session titled Financial Planning Strategies for Single Women. Uh, my name is Joe Connor, and I am the Friends Life Care's Chief Financial and Administrative Officer, and I'll be moderating this session and the remaining sessions we have today. Um, before we get started, just want to take a minute to go over some housekeeping information to ensure you know how to fully participate in today's webinar. You'll have the opportunity to submit questions or any comments at any time during the presentation in the Q&A box at the bottom of your page. Uh, this session's presenter, she will be asking a few questions during the presentation. And when the questions are asked, I'd ask that you just uh, plug your answer in the Q&A box and we'll, uh, and we'll get the answers to, uh, to Meg. Um, I'd like to introduce our, our presenter um, and her name is Meg Todd and she is a financial advisor with Connolly and Moore Wealth Management of Wells Fargo Advisors and is a seasoned professional with over 30 years experience in the financial services industry encompassing the brokerage, private banking and advisory environments. Uh, she provides customized wealth management services to high net worth clients. Meg is also passionate about providing financial education to women, empowering them to navigate life's transitions with confidence. So Meg, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thanks, Joe, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I hope you are all safe and healthy and looking forward to a, a better year this year. Um, when I give this presentation live, I really enjoy the interaction with the audience. So I encourage you to participate um, by using the chat box that, that Joe talked about. So this coming May, it will be 37 years since I graduated from college. And I, I wanna start by telling you a story about a, the graduation card that my dad gave to me that day. It said, buy low, sell high. And he opened up the card and it said, and marry money. Uh, I remember just laughing and rolling my eyes at him. Um, but it, it's amazing that almost four decades later, we're still talking about why the financial life of a woman is different. Okay, so there are three things I want you to walk away with today. First, what the implications are of being a woman on wealth. Second, why women make great investors. And finally, what you can do to help yourself and, and the women you care about. So the jazz pianist Ubi Blake said, if I'd known I was going to live this long, I would take better, I would have taken better care of myself. So there are a couple of reasons why planning and investing is different for women. Uh, first, women are living longer. In the US, there are 105 baby boys born for every 100 baby girls. What age do you think that ratio shifts? Where there are, um, at what age are there more girls than boys? Can you take a guess and type it into the, the chat box? At what age are there more girls than boys? Any guesses? I don't see any yet. No guesses? Okay, well, I will tell you. 35, and I was a little shocked at that. Women begin to outnumber men at age 35, and the margin grows larger through their peak earning years and into retirement. And so by the age of 80, women are over 60% of the population. The fact that we're living longer is an important consideration, which we'll talk about more in a minute, but it also explains why women are getting more involved in managing their financial lives. Over 40% of women over age 65 are widows. So there are other reasons why women are increasingly becoming more involved in the financial decision-making process. Education, women have accounted for more college degrees than men in the US now for over a decade. They earn half the medical and law degrees there are more female executives, billionaires, and, and business leaders than ever before, and marital status. In addition to a longer life expectancy, higher divorce rates is also a contributing factor. So now more than ever, women are participating in their own financial lives. And what's important to remember is that a, a woman's approach to financial, a woman approaches her financial planning with maybe a different set of priorities. So let's look at that. 
women generally do have different priorities than men. Where do you think men rank retirement savings on their list of priorities? And how do you think women rank retirement savings? Do you think they, do you think women rank retirement savings higher or lower than men? Do we have any thoughts on that? No guesses? Okay, well, I'll tell you. So men rank retirement savings number one and women rank retirement savings number five. Women rank retirement savings below meeting daily living costs, paying off debt, covering housing expenses, and, and just general savings. But you know what, there's another way to look at this slide. Um, and I think it actually is a positive for women. So let's look at these pictures for a minute. What do you think that the men in this picture are talking about other than their, their golf game? Do you have any, if these three guys are finishing up their, their round of golf and they're chatting, what do you think they're talking about? You know, they might be talking about, um, you know, how they're going to reallocate their 401k based on what the market did last week, or maybe they're sharing a hot stock tip. Now, what do we think the women are talking about? They're sitting there having a cup of coffee. Well, one might be worrying you know, about how she's gonna pay for her son's college education now that he got into his dream school. You know, another of these uh, women might be saying, you know, there's no way I'm getting on that plane next week with my husband for vacation uh, until we sign those estate planning documents. And, you know, another woman might be asking for advice um, you know, on the care and the financial requirements for her aging parents. So in my view, the benefit of focusing on and creating a plan around your most important life goals is greater than being able to talk the talk about the market. An investment plan can't be created in a vacuum. It has to be part of a comprehensive financial uh, plan. And women tend to approach things sort of in, in that way. So there are some more differences between uh, men and women. There's also the income gap. It still exists. It's still an issue. Across the board, even with advanced degrees, women are earning less than their male counterparts. So we've got, you know, longer life expectancy, different uh, uh, you know, different priorities, the income gap, and risk is also an issue. Now, Sally Krawcheck, I don't know if you are familiar with her, she is the CEO of Elevest, and Elevest is a company that focuses on women and investing, and she actually founded the PAX Elevate Global Women's Leadership Fund, which is a mutual fund that invests exclusively in women-led companies. So Sally argues that rather than risk averse, women are just more risk aware. And that's really a good thing. Um, however, it's important for all of us to determine what level of risk is necessary to attain our individual goals and to have the confidence, which I believe you get through education, to stay the course even, even when it feels a little scary. So again, we've talked about longevity, financial priorities, the income gap, and, and risk. So women's financial planning is truly different. Um, let's take a look at George and Anna. The information on this screen, um, we pull a lot of it from that income gap slide that we just looked at. So over the course of George's working lifetime, he has earned just over $2 million, and we're Breaking that down, if we break that down over a 40-year working life, that's about $55,000 per year. So we're assuming that he's saving 10% 10 10 of his salary and earning a 7% rate of return. So if he does that, he'll have probably just over a million dollars by the time he retires. And if he's expecting to live 20 years in retirement, he can plan for roughly $8,500 per month in retirement income. So now we take a look at Anna. 
So Anna is going to live longer, right? She's going to live probably five years longer than George. Um, so now we're spreading her income over a 25 year period instead of a 20 year period. So that monthly income now drops from roughly 8,500 to roughly 7,700. And then we assume Anna is probably more risk aware. So not always, but being more risk aware may result in her choosing a more conservative approach to investing. And that may lead to a slightly lower average rate of return. So let's assume Anna, instead of earning 7% a year through the accumulation period and through her retirement period, let's assume she's going to earn 5%. That now reduces her monthly income in retirement to about 3,800. And then finally, Anna probably earned less than George through her working years. So again, based on that income gap slide, if George made 2.1 million over the course of his career, Anna made 1.3 million over the course of her career. Now, Anna still saved 10% of her salary each and every year, but because of longer life expectancy, slightly more conservative approach to investing, and the fact that she was making less money, her monthly retirement income is now reduced to about $2,300 per month compared to George's $8,500. So you can see that we really need to make, we really need to be aware, each of us need to be aware of how these factors are impacting your particular situation. So whether we earn it, marry it, inherit it, or outlive it, the bottom line is that nine out of 10 women will be solely responsible for their, finance, for their finances at some point in the future. So 100% of us need to be prepared to do that. Um, you know, the good news for us though, is that, that women do make good investors. So the market is actually gender neutral. Men and women are going to experience the same market cycles uh, so for instance, looking back to, you know, 2000, the tech bubble, I'm sure you remember that, um, both men and women experienced that, you know, at the same time and in the same way. Then in 2008, when we had the total credit crisis, you know, financial implosion of 2008, again, men and women both experienced that. Um, so both men and women are essentially weathering the same storms. The emotions we feel are also gender neutral. This is the emotional roller coaster that all of us as investors face. We move quickly from optimism to excitement to euphoria. Things are great. The market is hot you know, let's up our risk level, let's invest every bit of our cash. What are we really doing at that point, at the point of euphoria, at the top of the market cycle? What are we really doing? We're buying, we're buying high, right? This is actually the point of maximum financial risk in the market cycle. Then the market begins to go the other way. Initially, we just feel a little anxious, but that anxiety, you know, can quickly turn to fear, panic, and despondency. We say, I can't take anymore. I can't sleep at night. Get me out. So what are we doing at this point? We are selling low. So ironically, that's the point of maximum opportunity. Human emotion will have us buying high and selling low every time. The opposite of what my dad's advice was and, and the opposite of what we should all be doing. This past year, we had the opportunity to go from euphoria to despondency and back to euphoria in, in a one year period, which is very unusual. Beginning in mid-February last year, we went from euphoria to despondency in about 22 days. The hard decision is not 
when to get out, it's when to get back in. If you got out of the market in March and you were waiting for the vaccine to be widely distributed, the economy to be back on track or for the political landscape to calm down, you would still be waiting and you would have missed out on an unprecedented recovery. So the emotions of investing can be devastating to both men and women. So what are we really doing on that roller coaster? We're chasing performance. The, the Russell 3000, which what we're looking at on, on the slide, the Russell 3000 is an index of the entire US stock market. This index returned an average of about 11% from 1984 through 2019. So essentially since I graduated from college, which is seems to me like a lifetime ago, an investor would, an inv well, what would, it, what would an investor have to have done in order to earn that same 11% average annual rate of return. They would have had to stay in the market, right? They would have had to stay in the market to earn the same thing that the index earned. So the average investor doesn't stay in because they listen to their gut and their gut is driven by their emotions. So what this slide is showing is that the, the, the average cost of chasing performance is about 2% per year. So in other words, the Russell 3000 averaged 11% over that period and the uh, average investor averaged just under 9%. So the 2% differential might not seem like much, but on an annual basis over a lifetime, it's going to be the difference between meeting your goals and not meeting your goals. So I'm sure that you're all familiar with Warren, Warren Buffett. He's one of the great investors of our time. Warren Buffett and women actually share similar characteristics when it comes to investing behavior. There's actually a book titled Warren Buffett Invests Like a Girl. So what do we have in common with, with Warren? Um, women take a long-term view when investing. Women have the kind of temperament that helps them achieve a long achieve long-term success in the market. Women do their research. Research sh shows that women spend more time researching their investment decisions. They trade less, women trade less. Women aren't as susceptible to peer pressure as men, which results in a more level-headed, patient approach to investing. So biological characteristics of our, our brain actually support women's success in investing. So let's take a look at that. Um, so there are some key differences between female and male brains, and I'm sure that you don't need me to tell you that. But specifically in regard to investing, our brain circuitry for language and expressing emotion is larger. So the result is women are better at expressing emotion and remembering details of emotional events. So this helps women remember mistakes, which helps us avoid future ones. The brain area that registers fear and aggression is larger in males which helps explain why they're usually more quick to fight versus a woman who is more apt to try and defuse a situation. This helps women to not be as quick to respond and have a more, again, level-headed approach. And women have more connections, apparently, between the right and left side of their brains, making them better at multitasking and excellent at verbal communication. And it's been found that you know, verbally sharing details and talking through choices is important. Talking through investment options encourages more thoughtful investing. So our brains seem well suited for investing, but let's look at, at the results of that. Now, I would be very careful to make any gross generalizations here because there are so many things that factor uh, in and impact investment returns. But this is a study from the UK that looked at excess performance over the FTSE 100 over a three-year period. Now the FTSE 100, all that is, is 
a index of the 100 largest companies that trade on the London Stock Exchange. So 100 companies. Women outperformed men in this study by 1.8%. The study also noted that women traded about nine times per year versus men who traded on average about 13 times per year. And I'm sure that contributed in some way to the differential in performance. So there are studies that do indicate that, that women are actually better investors when it comes to comparing, comparing performance. So what are the next steps? Amelia Earhart tells us that the most difficult thing is the decision to act. The rest is merely tenacity. So the first step is getting organized and making sure you have these documents accessible for yourself and others. This is the first step if you're going to pursue financial planning and specifically looking at your estate planning because relative to estate planning, pulling everything together is something you do for others. It's not something you're really doing for yourself. If you're single, this is so critical and the most loving thing you can do for the, the friend or the family member that will be handling your financial affairs. Even if you're married, even if you're married, have the conversation with your spouse and have the conversation with the, the person that would be acting on your behalf if something happened to both of you together, that, that happens. And this can, be, this can be a very difficult conversation to have. I know my, my sister is my executor, trustee and power of attorney in my estate plan. And her response has always been, can we talk about this some other time? Or why do we have to talk about this? And, and she's a nurse. She can deal with critical medical emergencies, something that I could never do. But she can't discuss my estate plan. She feels like if we talk about it, something bad will happen. So, you know, I can't change that. But what I can do is prepare for you know, the event that something does happen to me. So, you know, I have a detailed word document. Some would call it a novel probably that outlines everything she needs to know if something were to happen to me. And, you know, I know, I know an, another woman who lost her husband, unfortunately to cancer. And she was really challenged initially after his death, primarily because she didn't know any of the passwords. Unfortunately, it was, it was a very short time between his diagnosis and his death. And, and this was a couple who absolutely adored each other. So I know he would, he would have never purposely uh, done anything to make it difficult for her. But, but later I asked her, you know, had they had a conversation about finances and passwords and all the rest once they knew his prognosis? And she said, no, she said, I didn't want him to think I was giving up. And she said, I don't think he wanted me to feel like he was giving up. So they never had the conversation. Having the conversation is so important and sometimes it's very hard. So the, the two most important things on this slide, I would say are one, passwords. You know, we live in a digital age, if I was giving this presentation probably 10 years ago, I would have said, create files and have a file for tax returns and have a file for checking and savings. And these would all be, you know, paper, paper files. Well, a lot of people don't do that anymore. It's all digital. So it is all driven by these passwords. So passwords, number one, number two, beneficiary designations, beneficiary forms trump everything. And beneficiary designations is something that people easily overlook. They think that they they have named the beneficiaries. They haven't. They think that they've updated them when they haven't. And now we're hearing my dog Sam. <laughs> so sorry about that. One of the one of the effects of living or uh, working from home now. Um, but anyway, so so again, first step 
pulling the information together, organizing it, and again, having the conversation with, with the people in your with the people in your life. So money is only a tool and it'll take you wherever you wish, but it will not replace you as the driver. So the second step after you pull all that information together is to identify your goals and create a plan. Remember the two pictures earlier in the presentation, the men talking after golf and the women having a cup of coffee. Any discussion of the market, asset allocation, or, or specific investment recommendations is irrelevant if those discussions and decisions are not aligned with a comprehensive financial plan. You can't know how you're going to get somewhere until you know where you're trying to go. Okay, so, so pulling the information together, data gathering, identifying goals, creating a plan. One of the most important outcomes from creating a plan around your financial goals is to determine your optimal asset allocation. And what I mean by that is what level of risk do you need to take on in order to meet your goals? If that level of risk is just too uncomfortable for you, then maybe the goals need to be reassessed. Alternatively, it might be that you have been taking on more risk than you need to in order to meet your goals and, and reducing risk could actually increase your probability of, of success. It has to do with your specific plan, not what anyone else is doing. So you might be familiar with Jim Cramer. If you ever watch CNBC, he's the host of Mad Money. And he, he is a very animated guy. And when he looks right into the camera and straight into your living room, you might think he's talking directly to you. He is not. He is not directly talking to you because he doesn't know you. He doesn't know anything about you. He doesn't know your financial life. He doesn't know your financial goals. So except for maybe becoming more familiar with some market lingo, what he is saying to the country on CNBC really is irrelevant to you and your individual plan. So the, the number one barrier is fear. Some women are so afraid to lose everything that they don't even play the game. So establishing a relationship with a trusted advisor that can take all that information that you've gathered, help you talk through what your goals are, helping you to assess what risk level you're comfortable with and what risk level you need to take. Having these, con con having these conversations and helping you sort of filter out all the noise, you know, that is coming, you know, from CNBC. Those are all really important things. So Historically, women have been conditioned to not concern themselves with finances. So we tend not to talk about it. And that really has to change. Many factors shape our money views. Our families, our family of origin is a significant teacher about money. Our culture, our cultural context plays an enormous role too in how money functions and, and what it represents to us. And financial resources, how much money did we grow up with influences our view of the world and our view of finances. We are the ones who can change this by starting the conversation, talking about finances, talking uh, to other women about finances, encouraging them to do the same thing. So the next few pages are going to go over some questions that we can use to get the conversation going. So my guess is that most of us on the call today are, are not in their 20s and 30s, but, but we might very well have children in our 20s and 30s. So here are some of the questions that that group should be asking themselves. How can I maximize my savings opportunities? How much should I be saving to my 401k? Uh, what child-related costs should I be thinking about? Should I have an emergency reserve? What type of investments should I be considering? What's the impact of taxes on my savings? 
student loan debt, that's huge right now. And do I need insurance? Do I need a will? So then we move on to people in their 40s and 50s and the questions change. The questions now are, uh, I think I might need to be planning a little bit more for my retirement. Should I be making catch up contributions? How much income will I receive from social security? Will I have enough to fund my children's college education? Should my asset allocation change as I get closer to retirement? Do I need to consider long-term care insurance? Should I be thinking about my aging parents? What estate planning considerations should I be looking at? And then finally, we move into our 60s and 70s. We're gonna be talking about how much money can I spend it in retirement? Or how much money do I want to spend in retirement? When should I begin receiving social security? How does that really work? What are the pros and cons of taking it earlier rather than deferring it? Should I stay in my current home or should I downsize? What type of estate planning do I need at this point? Do I have enough long-term care insurance? Have my advanced directives and my powers of attorney been updated? Can I support my grandchildren's education? Can I contribute to the charitable organizations that are important to me? And can I afford to travel in retirement? So these are all really important questions. So if you do not already have a relationship with a trusted advisor, I, I would really encourage you to find one. And I would also encourage you to find an advisor who creates an investment plan as a component of a holistic financial planning relationship. Again, you, you can't invest in a vacuum. You really need to invest as, as, as part of a bigger plan. You're gonna to wanna to find someone that you value, what they deliver, you value what they deliver to you, and, they, and you trust that they're always gonna have your best interests in mind. So how do you find that person? Well, I would suggest, again, starting a conversation. Find a friend, a colleague, a family member who you trust, whose opinion you value, and ask them who they're working with. And then interview these people. Interview them, ask questions, look for some of the words, the key words that we've talked about today. And finally, go with your gut. I mean, that emotional intuition that we were born with can help us with this, right? They can help us make the decision because what you're really looking for is a, a long-term trusted personal planning relationship, not just an investment plan. So we've talked about women's health and wealth. We've talked about why women make great investors, and we've talked about ideas for next steps. So I will leave you with this. Three birds are, are sitting here on a vine and two decide to fly away. And how many birds are still sitting on the vine? Does anyone want to take a shot at the, um, the chat box? No? Nope. Okay. Well, the answer is all three are still sitting on the vine. You can make a decision and still choose not to act. So decisions require action. So what will your next step be? So thank you. Thank you for, for listening. And at this point, Joe, I'm happy to, I'm happy to answer any specific questions you might have on, on anything I talked about or really anything else. Um, I would, I would encourage you, um, if you want to talk specifically about your particular situation, feel free to reach out to me offline. But Joe, do we have any, any questions? Meg, we don't have any questions in the chat. Uh, just to reach out to you, they can either send an email to info at friendslifecarepartners.org and Gail Tamarchio, who runs these Vigor workshops, will be able to get in touch with you. And as you said earlier to us, you know, if they really want to reach out to you directly, they can look you up, just do a Google search for Meg Todd and um, 
would it be a Wells Fargo search, I think, or? Yeah, if, we, if you just Google Meg Todd CFP, it would come up. My email is Meg, M-E-G, dot Todd, T-O-D-D, -D, at Wells Fargo Advisors.com. But again, even if you Google that, it'll it'll come right up. The name of my firm is Conley and Moore Wealth Management. So Meg, as you and I were talking earlier, and said I was going to be surprised if you tell me how a woman is a better investor. My wife is going to be very surprised when I get home tonight when I hand her over all the investment accounts and let her make all the decisions. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not a matter of handing it over. It's a matter of bringing her into the conversation and bringing her into the process. Uh, assuming she's not already already doing that. I know for a fact she'd make different decisions than I do. I, I mm -hmm. can just, just just our personalities and our risk tolerances are so much different. So mm -hmm. um, the other thing, and I, I if if folks were on other uh, presentations, they heard me say this already. And it's one of those things that just just kind of slips through the cracks. Like I've done a lot of work with my will and uh, trusts and things like that. The one thing that um, I want I take away from these presentations today is all the passwords. Mm -hmm. I manage all of our investments. I manage our retirement accounts. And I've turned off all the finance, all the paper statements. Mm -hmm. So if I was to pass away today, God forbid, um, my wife would have a hard time finding all of our our assets because everything's digital. And uh, so one of the things I'm taking away from this is making a list of all of our sites that I go to and all the, the usernames and passwords for each one of them because each one of them is different because that's a good thing to do. So it wouldn't be one password and 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 uh, log on. So um, that was one thing. And you're the second of our presenters that have brought that issue up. And it's just something you just don't always think about. And it's and and like you said, 10 years ago, you wouldn't even have thought of that. So mm -hmm. it's the changing environment. And that changing environment requiring you to, to rethink is like you don't put your will in your sock drawer and just leave it there for 30 years. Environments change, situations change, and you have to always be revisiting it. Right. So it's, to your points, Joe, um, you know, I, I work with both single women and married couples. And the with the married couples, I find that sometimes having these conversations with me part of the conversation helps. It's almost like, I think on one of the slides, you know, it said financial therapist. Yes. Believe me, in many, many situations, uh, you know, I, I kind of slip into that role. And sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm practicing, I don't know if it's practicing medicine, but practicing psychology without a license. Every, every financial planner should get a minor in psychology because, you know, working with couples is right. probably part couples therapy. Right. So, I mean, sometimes just navigating that conversation, facilitating the conversation, um, you know, really helps, really helps. And I don't know how you feel, Joe, but I know women have also said to me after the fact, because again, I do work with a lot of women um, who have lost their husbands and they, they might say to me, well, I wanted to get more involved, but I didn't want him to feel like I was questioning him or I didn't trust him or I didn't think he was doing a good job. And so that that prevents the, the women from, from engaging in the process. And I think that maybe including a third party in that conversation makes it, you know, makes it a little bit easier. And because unfortunately, you know, I do, I, I, you know, tend to work with a lot of women that, you know, that, that arrive overwhelmed, not, not knowing what they need to know about their own financial situation, whether it's passwords or just really having any idea and always, you know, maybe assuming that they were well positioned, but again, when they start thinking, okay, well, how well positioned am I, um, now that I probably will live into my 90s, even my even though my husband, you know, passed away in his early 70s, mm -hmm. how well positioned am I, given the fact that I'm not going to be able to sleep at night knowing how aggressively allocated we are. I didn't even realize we were that aggressively allocated, and I'm not going to be sleep at night. So we're going to have to shift and be a little bit more conservative. So with this longer life expectancy, 
at a more conservative allocation, are, am I still well positioned? So I, I think the role of a financial advisor can just be um, so important in so many areas. I'll tell you, in, in my situation, it, it's been a, a great relationship in that area. It's never caused any problems. And uh, my wife was a stay-at-home mom for a good 12, 13 years. And mm -hmm. you know, I handled it. She had all of her duties, like just wasn't on her radar. So I took on that role of you know, managing the investments. But she's gone back into the work environment and she has her own 401k and she wanted to get involved on how to invest her 401k. So we opened up and we looked at everything and how we're investing everywhere. So it, it was, it, it's in my case, it's a mutual uh, decision on how we're investing. And I think it's great because it, God forbid, you know, something bad happens to me, but hopefully I live just as long as her. Maybe she can live a couple of years after me, mm -hmm. but hopefully we have 25 years of retirement at some point, but knowing that we both are involved in it is, it's been a, it's been great. And I think I read, you know, if uh, the participants in this presentation aren't getting involved, I think Meg has given you every reason and, and the, and the, the map to do it. So Meg, I want to appreciate, again, there's no additional questions in the question and answer. So I'm going to wrap this up and uh, just give me a minute to do a little exit here. Uh, I want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. Um, we will, uh, you'll be able to join us for our additional webinars. We have two additional webinars uh, remaining today. The first one, which starts at 145 today is Wanted Dead or Alive, which do you need? An elder attorney or an estate attorney? And then the final seminar we have today is Savvy Money Habits. So um, in addition to how you should manage your money and types of investments, our last present presenters will talk about how to manage your money from a day-to-day -day standpoint. Um, a registration link was in the reminder email. So if you haven't signed up for any of our remaining webinars and you would like to, uh, you have a reminder in the email that you got for this presentation. And all of the presentations that are being done over yesterday and today will be posted on our website, friendslifecare.org. And uh, once you leave this, this today's webinar, there will be a quick five question survey. We appreciate if you would complete that survey and give us feedback on how we can continue to improve in the future on these webinars that we present to you. And finally, uh, within 24 hours, you'll receive an email of where the, the, the presentations are, are posted. And uh, I wanna thank you. I look forward to seeing you if you're able to make any of our two remaining webinars. And um, I wish you a, a wonderful rest of your day. And Meg, I appreciate all your time and all your information that you provided us today. Oh, you're welcome. Great thank you. Thank you.